أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواه العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين آمين يا رب العالمين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين وإذا قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل ننبئكم بالأخصرين عمالا الذين ظل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون صنعا صدق الله العلي العظيم Assalamu alaikum jamia wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So today we're going to be continuing our series of sessions on this idea of the battle for your mind. Now some of you are probably thinking, why for the last couple of sessions did Shabir, a couple, maybe two and a half sessions, did Shabir go on a tangent almost, discussing usul ad-deen and furu ad-deen and you know, we, we know this. We get taught this from childhood. Why, why is this something we have to discuss? Because in order to first know what your mind is, in order to understand what your responsibility is, you have to, absolutely have to, be aware of your duties within Islam. You have to first understand what is the goal of Islam, what is our entire purpose on this planet. Allah says in Quran that I haven't created the jinn or the insan except that they should worship me. So what does this worship me mean? And what exactly, yeah, really, what is worship me? Does worship me mean that Allah Ta'ala wants us to just pray all the time 24-7? Does he want us to just fast all the time? Does he want us to do majalis all the time? No. Every breath you take can and arguably is a worship of Allah. You just have to understand it. Worship of Allah is when you do an activity with awareness of Allah and within the confines of Allah's hudud, Allah's boundaries, the boundaries he set for us, boundaries that in reality don't impact Allah in any way. Allah is a constant, an absolute constant. He is the only absolute constant. Nothing we or anyone else does will change Allah. He is Allah. Khalas, that's it. He is Allah. What changes is our awareness of Allah, our taqwa, our cognizance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to build on this. And we have understood, inshallah, through these few sessions so far that Allah ta'ala has given us this, this umbrella of Adla ilahi, his justice, and inside his justice, he has placed the ideas of nubuwa and imama with a view to getting us through the gateway or the exam of qiyama. And within his justice and imama and nubuwa, he gave us Quran and he gave us the furu, the furu ad din, the branches of religion, the ideas in Islam which give us the the let the practical aspects that we have to follow, that we have to abide by. So all of this, this is all very nice. Everyone knows this. Why are we talking about this? Or why did we talk about this? Why have we tried to explain this? <clears throat> because there are a number of concepts within those that we sometimes forget, that become neglected. The ideas of tawalla and tabarra, the ideas of amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar, the idea of jihad. And, you know, like I mentioned, I'm not saying everyone pick up a sword and ya Allah. No. That component of jihad is there and there is a time and place for it. But the main jihad is against yourself. And also, amr bil ma'roof, nahi anil munkar, tawalla and tabarra all come within jihad. Because it's a struggle to tell your brother to do something good or not to do something bad. It's a struggle against yourself not to hate. Because like we said, hating is something which is identical to love except the direction. When you hate someone or something, it's always playing upon your mind. 
We also tried to understand that the idea of la'an is not curse in the English language's definition of the word curse, because the word curse in English implies hate. It has a connection to the word hate or to the emotion hate. Whereas la'an, from our perspective, is a dua. It's a supplication that, oh Allah, keep your mercy away from such and such person or from such and such from people with such and such qualities so that because they are harming society so on that subject of valimin it segues neatly into the beginning of today's session we have to use all of these ideas that we have and of course in the furu we reference back to our maraja and to the wali faqih to understand whereas in the usul we have to understand ourselves of course that doesn't mean that we just make it up as we go along no understanding yourself means you have to do your research you have to go and read you have to listen to lectures but like i've said throughout this series regardless of whether someone is wearing these clothes or they're not wearing these clothes and they're speaking to you verify because the first ayah that makes up the bracket tells us that you should verify granted that ayah is talking about a fasik specifically but i'm saying to you that whatever anyone says to you confirm it verify it if it doesn't compute if it doesn't make sense if it goes against the norm or what feels correct don't just blindly accept it go and verify see if there's other ulama saying the same thing who are these other ulama and above all go and see what the righteous maraja are saying if the person who is speaking to you is saying something in line with what the maraja and the wali faqih are saying then there's a good chance that he's being fair with you if that person is saying something completely different for example we live in the age of covid and during this time said sistani hafizahullah and imam khamenei hafizahullah have both said that for your muharram majalis you need to maintain uh you know if you're going into your centers if it's feasible for you to open your centers then you have to make sure that you have social distancing and masks and you make sure you protect against any potentially elderly or unwell people and you know you make sure that you try and avoid spreading this illness and if that isn't possible then do it like we're doing it right now electronically online if you find someone comes along to you and says ya jamaa all people you should go today to karbala and you should congregate shoulder to shoulder and everything will be fine because imam hussein is there habibi look yes imam hussein is there no one is disputing this but at the same time allah has told us not to be a little bit dim shall we say if there is a pandemic which is caught by people in contact with each other then even if right inside the proxim the proximities of kaaba that is a natural thing it's a natural phenomenon it will happen if it's going to happen it will happen so maintain the precaution it's it's like the idea of the man who you know it's a hadith it's a famous hadith where there was a man he comes into the town and he takes his camel and he just puts it in the middle of the square and goes about his business he prays to allah that allah keep protect protect my camel after doing his business he comes back his camel is gone Of course his camel is gone you don't tie your camel up someone is going to take it away or the camel is going to run away and there's no use you crying about it it's like me not locking my car maybe even not leaving my keys but just not locking my car you know going inside my house or going to the office or whatever and then i come back and i say i phone my wife say uh, car's gone yeah who is the idiot in that situation who is the person who didn't think particularly well so we have to understand we have to understand who the person is that is telling us something reason why this is important and why we can't i mean yes you have the idea of the senior ulama the maraja the wali faqi that's a different game but you still have to verify who they are let's say tomorrow tomorrow on some whatsapp group on facebook alayhi salam or anything you hear that shabir hasan ali has declared his marjaniya what are you going to do after you stop laughing What are you going to do? You're going to start following this clown? You have to verify who is this person? What are his credentials? Just like you're not going to go to 
you know, someone who decides that they're a doctor after, you know, maybe doing an online course from some internet site saying that they know about neurosurgery, you need to verify. So whoever you're listening to, verify, understand. And if it's a senior maraja, if it's a wali faqih, that is different. But make sure you know who the senior maraja and the righteous senior maraja and the wali faqih. Because there are also people who profess to be in positions of authority, but who are the enemy. And one of the other brothers during this ses- these uh, Muharram sessions has been discussing that quite eloquently. So I'll leave that to him. When looking for the idea of an oppressor or an oppressed person, and by oppression, I don't just mean someone who is actively harming someone. Someone who lies to you is oppressing you. That person is an oppressor because to lie to you is to deceive you. To deceive you is to want you to make a mistake. When someone wants harm for you, this is a dhulm. This is someone oppressing you. So we have to understand all of this through the lens of Islam. Imam Ali said something very, very interesting, very important. Know the truth so that you know its people. Know the truth so that you know its people. And the first way to know the truth as we've been saying through these sessions, is to develop that closeness with Allah. How do you do that? You develop a closeness with Qur'an. When you focus on Qur'an, when you reflect on Qur'an, when you read Qur'an, not necessarily in Arabic if you don't know Arabic. There's, look, there is value in reading Qur'an in Arabic, without a doubt. But at the same time, if I'm just sitting there and I'm reading Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alif lam mim dhalik al-kitab la rayafu, how many of you understood that? Right? If you're not understanding it, then while the barakat of reciting these words of Allah in the clearest language, which of course the Quran even says is Arabic, you have to go away and read it in your own language and spend time reading it in your own language. And Quran itself says, Afala yatadabbaruna al Quran. Why don't you sit and reflect upon the Quran? It says, go and think about it. When there's many, many examples in, in, in Quran of that we discussed, where we said Allah doesn't bog you down with detail in Quran. He gives you an event. He doesn't give you the details about the date and the time and the place and the color of shirt that such and such prophet was wearing or the flavor of the curry over there or any other detail that is irrelevant. Allah only gives you that which you need. Give me a salawat. And there is a strong reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gives you that. Because Allah knows us better than we know ourselves. We might think we're big people and we know everything. We're nothing. We know nothing. We really, we know nothing. So Allah knows our limitations. He knows that we have the attention span that is smaller than that of a goldfish. We get bored very quickly, especially in this day, the age of the internet and the age of like <laughs> things like Twitter and WhatsApp and all of this. We're very sort of, you know, we, we, we get bored very quickly, you know. You know, there's maybe there's someone in this session listening to what is this man saying? I'm getting bored. I'm gonna switch over to another one. Maybe there's people thinking like this. I don't know. Sometimes even I think it. We're human. So you have to have a way of discerning what is the truth. The truth is not necessarily. Someone who is sitting there, you know, wearing these clothes and saying, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah. No, this doesn't make someone truthful. This makes someone, okay, he wants to be a believer. He wants to do tasbih. And he sits on a Zoom session, that tasbih, okay, is full of riya. MashaAllah. May Allah guide him. Don't fall into the trap of this pseudo piety this pseudo sort of uh, false sense of piety that some people exude. Look at people who are actually doing something, who are actually active, who are actually working. And above all, above all, look at what they're saying. Does it correlate with what the maraja is saying, with what the wali is saying? And does it correlate with Quran? You know, when in the science of hadith, in the science of determining the validity of a hadith, 
There are many, many, many conditions that you have to go through. Among the conditions are you look at the content of the hadith, the actual what we call the mat. And if that mat correlates with Quran, then you proceed to look at the actual people who've transmitted it. But our problem is we don't know Quran, we don't know the stories in Quran well enough to even determine whether the matin is of a particular story or a particular idea has any validity. So we have to improve our closeness to Quran. This is necessary. Otherwise, every Tom, Dick and Habib will come along and confuse us. Because, Wallahi, let me ask you a question. If I was to sit over here, now many of you will have noticed the language I use is very simple. I try and deliberately keep the language extremely simple. But there are some people who will use extremely massive words, confusing words, huge concepts in X, Y, Z, this, this, this. I can't even remember some of these words. They use. Allah, I think. But you have to ask yourself, why is this man doing this? The purpose of someone sitting here like me is not to make himself feel like, oh my God, you know, this Amama, mashallah, I am something special. No, it is to make sure that I discharge the responsibility that the Amama means. The responsibility as a student in the Hausa, as a, we are called yani, the Hausa students, and every believer is really a student, is a soldier of Imam Mahdi. To be that, I have to help the people. Helping the people doesn't happen if all my entire life is preoccupied with making people think, MashaAllah, this Shabir, SubhanAllah, he's, I don't know, a student of Ayatollah X, and he has studied wonderful theosophy of bananas and cabbages or something. So we have to be able to discern what is right from what is wrong and to remove the rubbish that sometimes clouds everything in the way. Real piety is very easy to determine when you're listening to someone. You look at someone like Sayyid Hassan or you look at someone like, for example, Sayyid Qaid, this is very clear. You know, a blind man can see this. It's even the Israelis about Sayyid Hassan. Even the Israelis say that when he speaks, we listen because we know he is the most honest person. So quickly moving on from that, why is this important? Because we are surrounded in a situation across the world, not just in the West, but globally, where we are bombarded with all manner of different information, be it on the internet, be it on the news channels, even on the Muslim news channels, all of them, they're bombarding you with all manner of different information. And from time to time, you'll hear speeches from politicians that maybe you don't know who is this politician. And you'll listen to the speech, and on the surface, you'll think, inshallah, seems good. But you've missed the subtext. And not only have you missed the subtext, you have not understood who this person is. And that's not necessarily, at the first instance, your fault. You have to examine what you're listening to. What does this person's agenda have? Think about it this way. Think about it this way. You're sitting with your family and, you know, it's a Sunday. It's not Shah Ramadan or Shah Muharram or Arba'in or anything. And you just want to watch something on TV. You want to watch something on, you know, Netflix or something, something like this. So you pick some program and it looks good. It's maybe space agey and I don't know. It's an interesting program, for example. Have you ever considered the message that some of these programs, many of these programs are giving without actually saying it overtly? They're doing something very, very dangerous, extremely dangerous. They will promote ideas of the breakup of the family without saying it. They won't say it overtly. They will just create a situation. And when you live in a society where the family has already been decimated for the most part, where the idea of divorce, for example, is considered everyday practice, very normal, where the idea of, you know, people having extramarital affairs and worse, committing haram, it's a very normal thing, where you even have apps on your phone to encourage this. 
When you live in such a society and the media is doing this to you, do you think it will not affect you? It will affect you. And this is why you need to be aware. Because like we've been saying through the last few sessions, shaitan is looking for attack vectors. He's looking for any vector he can get to harm you. And even if you're a mutadayin, and a practicing Muslim, Muslim person, he's still looking for a In fact, he's working 10 times harder on you, 100 times harder on you. Because those people that go to the clubs and play with these crazy apps and do this, that, and the other, Habibi, they're already with him. They're of no interest to him. He cares about you who has come to a Muharram program, who prays, who fasts, who you know reads Quran. He's concerned. He's saying, I have these people, man. If there's enough of these people come along, then it's you know it's the end game. Imam Mahdi comes and khalas, it's over. Because remember, Shaitan, when Imam Mahdi comes, he knows that that point it's finished for him. The end is there. Yom Qiyamah, Shaitan is going one place. He knows this. There's no second chance or anything for him. He's going one place, end of story. He wants to take as many of us with him. And worse yet, he targets the believer. So the believer sitting down with his family, you know, he's watching some program where they're subliminally, they're not doing it overtly, they don't need to do it in a way that's like in your face, because that stage has already passed. It's already in your face. Everywhere you go, you go to college, university, work, you go to the supermarket, all of this crazy is happening. So we should be aware of this. All of this is part of the battle to take over your mind. Shaitan is busy. Another thing that the media will sometimes do is that shaitan knows that certain things to a mu'min, they won't have any impact on him. Mu'min, he's tough, he's organized. He might watch a program, but it won't have an effect on him. He'll just like fast forward or mute or whatever it is he needs to do during those portions. But what it will do is he will try and normalize things. Because it's one thing if you as a mu'min do not do such and such activity. But if in your society, and by society I mean your immediate community or your family, this thing is considered normal, then you have a problem. Because one of the worst things, the last stages before the destruction of any society, is the normalization of a sin. If you look in Quran, we have the story of Nabi Lut. And Nabi Lut's people had no respect for each other. They harmed each other. They did things that were completely haram. That was on one side. But the real problem, the real thing that resulted in their full destruction was that they normalized it it became something that was normal. There was no sin in it. Look, when someone commits a haram, they feel shy, they feel bad, as long as this is in the beginning. They feel bad, they they don't want to do it, they know they've done something wrong, they might go and do istighfar, or they'll try and have the tawfiq to do istighfar, and they will feel bad about it. But if they don't remedy themselves and they keep repeating this and keep repeating this and keep repeating this and keep repeating this, then over time, and if no one tells them, their brothers, sisters, family members, friends, no one does Nahi Anil Munkar. No one does Amr Bil Ma'ruf. If this happens, then this person over time will normalize that particular guna, that particular sin, will become normalized for that person. When a sin becomes normalized for a person, this is the end. This is khalas. This is when you've got serious problems. And according to some teachers, they say that the normalization of a sin is a harbinger of the destruction of a person or a society. And so normally in any society, there's always a few people 
that will enjoin the bad. Consider the media and all of this. And there are actually very few. And you have a very small number of people also who are enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. One side is enjoining the evil and forbidding the good. The other side is enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Both sides are very small. And it's the majority of the people that have to determine where the truth is and go with that side. And this is really, really important. But then someone says, I don't know where the truth is really. The truth is very complicated. You know, I have this Shabir saying all of these things. It's confusing and I want to try and I don't understand. The truth, good and bad, is innate within us. Everyone knows what is good and bad. Quran says in Surah Al-Insan, which is Surah number 76, in the first three ayat, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Has there come upon mankind a period of time when he was nothing? He wasn't anything of significance, anything to be mentioned. Then Allah says, we created man from a small thing, a small liquid, to test him. And we gave him the faculties of hearing and seeing. And then Allah says, Inna hadayna sabila." We guided him to the right way. He has the option of being thankful for this, or he can choose to reject it. You have an option. But the fact that Allah guided us to the right way, he gave us a baseline understanding of what is good and what is bad, is already in place. If we forget what is good and bad because of we, the impact we let society and tarot and shaitan ultimately have upon us, then this is something that is a disaster for us and something we have to work against. Give me a salawat. See, today's subject was going to move very quickly to a particular character uh, in history where, we, where all of these ideas come together. But in order to actually get there, I'm finding that we have a little bit more work to do. So maybe we'll have to discuss the idea of Mukhtar Thaqafi and how he falls into this bracket of being someone who worked properly through all of these tribulations and how we can take lessons from him, we may have to extend this for a few more sessions. Because these baseline ideas are really, really important, and I need you to pay attention to them. So if, if, if I'm being a little bit boring and a bit repetitive, I apologize. But these are so important, these ideas, that I have no choice, I have to be. But we'll try and proceed quickly. Give me another loud salawat. So we have this idea where the truth has been given to people. Now we spoke about very briefly this idea. We said that there's always a small number of people pulling away from the truth and a small number of people trying to pull back, the, you know, to the, bring people back to the truth. And a very clear example of this in Quran is the story of Thamud and uh, the tribe of Thamud and Prophet Saleh. According to some riwayat, the tribe of Thamud, in Quran it doesn't say where they were, because again, Quran doesn't focus on irrelevant detail, but human beings, we like irrelevant detail. So according to some riwayat, according to some history, it says that they were in the northern part of Arabia. And there is a remnant of Thamud still remaining. Quran basically says, that to the Thamud, and this is in Surah An-Naml, which is the ants, it's verses number 45 to 43, uh, 53, apologize, 40, 45 to 53. It says, Allah Ta'ala is saying, and we sent to Thamud their brother Saleh, which means that Nabi Saleh was from Thamud. He was from that community, from that tribe. And he said to them, worship Allah. But unfortunately, they became factions fighting each other. 
He then said, Oh, my people, and we should reflect on what he's saying. Oh, my people, why are you quick to do evil rather than good? If only you would seek God's forgiveness so that he might show you mercy. And that ayah is a really important ayah because I want each and every one of you to ask yourselves very honestly. And I'm asking myself this question first and foremost. When we have to do a good activity, how many of us will dither just a wee bit, just a tiny little bit before we do it? And when we have to do something which is, let's say, even mubah, neither haram nor halal, but, you know, there, we'll be pretty quick to it. And many a time, unfortunately, when we do something haram, we're very quick to do it. It's something that happens very quickly. But to do good, it's very slow. It's very awkward. We'll try and... Homs is an example. I know I've used Homs a few times, but this is a serious problem within the Shia community at the moment, unfortunately. We look for loopholes. You know, when we want to pay the tax man, the HMRC over here, we have an accountant and the accountant decides to do, I don't know what it is accountants do, some interesting stuff. And he tells you, you have to pay this much, move on. We take homes to be like the tax that we have to pay to HMRC, but this is to Allah's HMRC. Actually, homes is not a tax, it's a gift. And the idea of looking for loopholes in paying homes, or finding excuses to pay less or not to pay or delay or all these different things that we do, this is a very big problem. And in Quran, Surah An Namal, Verse number 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Nabi Saleh said to his people, O oh my people, why are you quick to do evil rather than good? If only you would seek God's forgiveness so that he might show mercy. Think about this. When we read the Quran, that particular verse, while it might be the words that Nabi Saleh said, these are words that should touch us, that should impact our hearts that should really break our hearts and really make us want to improve ourselves and reform. So the people said to Nabi Saleh in reply, instead of saying, yeah, Nabi Allah, you're right. Yes, we're very sorry. Please guide us. They said, we consider you an ill omen and those with you are also an ill omen. And he said that your omen is with God. Yani Allah is the one who you have a problem with. When you say that we're evil and that the people with Nabi Saleh are evil, Nabi Saleh is telling them, actually, your problem is with Allah. In fact, you are a people who is being tested. And everyone is being tested every time. We sitting here, we are being tested. Then a very interesting ayah comes along. Because you know I said Allah doesn't give specifics unless they're absolutely necessary. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 48 of Surah an naml says, In the city there was a gang of nine who made mischief in the land and did no good. Allah has been very specific. He said inside that city where Nabi Saleh went, which the people of Thamud used to live in, there were nine people. Yes. This is not a metaphoric nine, as in Allah is trying to say a small number. Because in Quran, when Allah wants to say a small number, He says Qalil. He could say, Wakana fil Madina, min al Mufsidin, for example. But He doesn't. He specifically said, Tis'ata, which Tis'a, the, the number Tis'a is the number nine in Arabic. He's explicitly saying nine. You have to ask yourself why. The lesson here is very clear. It took nine people, nine, to destroy a society. We live in a society where we have a handful of media engines. The BBC, VOA, CNN. I don't know. They're all owned, all of these folks and MSNBC, this, this, this. 
all of these media engines are owned by a handful of people. The Times, you might think it's different to the Telegraph or the, I don't know, I don't know papers in Ireland, but papers over here, the Times, the Independent, the Telegraph, the this, the that. You might think they're owned by different people because they pitch slightly different things. They're the same. They're owned by the same people. Trace the money. They're owned by the same people. And those people own many of the other organizations that have an impact on your daily life. So continuing on, these people, they then continued and they conspired against Nabi Saleh. They said that, that, that we will attack him and his family by night and then tell his guardian that we did not witness the murder of his family and we are being truthful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the most, one of the most beautiful lines where they planned a plan and we, I mean, Allah planned a plan, but they did not notice that Allah is planning. So look at the outcome of what their planning was. Allah destroyed them and their people collectively. And then Allah says that, look, the area of Thamud, where they were, they used to carve into the rocks. This is there in Northern Arabia. Allah says, here are their homes in ruins on account of their iniquities. Surely in this is a sign for those who know. And Allah also says, and we saved those who believed and were pious. So give me a salawat. So you see, it took just a handful of people to have an entire community destroyed. Why? Because the bulk of the people didn't do their responsibility. They didn't do their duty. And when Allah tested them, of course, Nabi Saleh and the story of the Sheikh Amal of Allah, the Naqat Allah, this is well known, but I'm not going to go into the whole story right now because I just wanted to make this point that it's only a handful of people that are pulling away and it's a handful of people that are pulling towards Allah. And we have to realize who is pulling us in which direction and then align ourselves with the ones that are going towards truth. You know, I, I was listening to one of the speeches earlier on uh, and one of the brothers reminded me of a, an event that I was actually privy to, that I was able to attend while I was in Qom. And we had Said Hassan come to Qom. He was in Matsahujatiya. He came to give a lecture to the students. And it was a very beautiful lecture. But Khulasa, just to give you a very small point from it, which is actually a very, very important hadith, which comes from, I believe it's from Rasul, Rasulullah to Ammar, where Rasulullah told Ammar along the lines of, that if you see all of the people go down this valley and you see Ammar, I see Ali going down this valley, follow Ali and Khali al nas leave the people. And Sayyid Hassan told us, he said, you Hausa students, if you see all of the ulama, all of the fuqaha, everyone, the whole world going in one direction, and you see Sayyid Ali, Imam Khamenei, going in another direction, then follow Imam Khamana and Khali Ala Nas, leave the people. So some of us after this, you know, we were when we came out, we were saying, SubhanAllah, he's comparing Sayyid Qaid to you know to Imam Ali and what's going on over here. But then it dawned on us, and this is the idea that we discovered from this: that there are always some people. Allah has promised that He will not leave His earth without a hujjah. There are multiple types of hujjah. You have the hujjah that is needed for the existence of creation, which is Imam al-Hujjah, Jalla ta'ala, Farajahu sharif But Imam al-Hujjah is in ghaybah. That doesn't mean he is neglectful and unaware of what we're doing. Allah is also a hujjah in, in and of himself. But for us, weak people who need a tangible person, we need someone who we can almost touch, someone who we can see, Allah provides us with a hujjah in the form of the righteous wali al-faqih and the righteous maraji. 
And if they are telling us one thing, and the whole world is telling us something else, and even we feel like, this manager has fatwa on this, and I'm not too happy about this fatwa, I don't like it. For example, manager says, you are not allowed to eat the food of such and such place, such and such type of people. I'm not going to give any types, but example. The people who worship the banana, you cannot go and eat their food. Even if it's a banana, you can't eat it. Halas, you're not allowed. Finished. So I get this fatwa. Now my best friend happens to be from those people that worship the banana. And man, his family, subhanAllah, they make really nice food. And you know, I have a problem. So I'll start looking for loopholes. And I'll go to the local sheikh in the masjid and say, Mawlana, I want to eat the food from these people, but the manager is saying, no, do you have any way I can do this? And the manager will come along and try and find, the local person, your friend, will come along and try and maybe help you. If he's a good person, then he will say, look, bro, if your manager says you can't do this, you can't do this, move on. If he's someone who is more nefarious, or someone who shaitan has taken a hold of, then he will say, yes, brother, we should find a loophole. Maybe maybe when they're cooking this, they're wearing gloves, you know. Maybe they're making this inside a, from a special type of banana which we're allowed, or you know, maybe they're not actually making, maybe they've got someone who cooks for them, you know, maybe they're getting it from the restaurant or whatever. This is loophole. This is looking for loopholes. We Muslims, especially we Shia, we're very, very, especially, unfortunately, my community, the Khoja, we are masters of looking for loopholes. We are the masters of loopholes. If we don't like a particular marja in Najaf, we will try and manufacture marja'iyah in the UK. This is happening. This is a game that is being played today. I'm not going to dwell on it, but this is a game that is being played today. So we have to be wary of this. There are many, many machinations happening. So how does this all relate to Mukhtar? Now, I have about seven minutes, so I'm just going to do a very quick muqaddama on this, and I apologize. The problem is this is such a vast subject that it's very difficult to, like, I've got my notes, like I said, I've got maybe nearly 50 pages now of notes, but I'm trying to get through at least one or two pages a day. I'm barely getting through a paragraph. So give me a loud salawat and I'll do a brief introduction to Mukhtar and then we move to Musibah. So, Mukhtar had three phases in his life, all of which are very, very important to understand. Of course, many of you are probably aware that uh, Islamic Republic of Iran and um, have made a series, I believe it's about 40 parts, called Mukhtar Nami, which is like the, the Mukhtar Chronicles about Mukhtar his entire life. And it encompasses the event of Ashura, it encompasses the rise of Mukhtar, the way he took revenge for uh, the massacre, he took the minor revenge for the massacre in Karbala, and he brought people like Umar ibn Sa'ad and Harmala and uh, Sana and bin Anas and all of these people and Shemar and all these people he brought them all to justice that is one side of Mukhtar that is the series by the way Mukhtar had three phases in his, in his life four but we're interested in three that are more important the first phase was the pre-Karbala phase the second phase was the Karbala phase so pre-Karbala, Karbala, and then post-Karbala, all the way through to his Shahada. And beyond that, we also have a conspiracy against Mukhtar, where Mukhtar was given lots of la'an and insults by people. Unfortunately, not necessarily from the Sunnah, from the Shia, or alleged Shia. And people called him a deviant, people called him from the Kaysaniya, people called him someone who worshipped Muhammad bin, Abi, I mean, uh, Muhammad bin Hanafiya, uh, Salam Allah alayhi, who was the brother, half-brother of Imam Hussain, and who was the naib of Imam Sajjad in Medina. And we'll come to all of this. But what is important about Mukhtar's life is that just like us, especially the final portion, the post-Karbala portion, 
he was in a situation where there was literally all around him was chaos. All around him was absolute chaos. You had people lying pathologically to achieve this agenda and that agenda. And amidst all of this noise, which is actually a similar time to what we live in right now, we have people saying one thing to forward a particular agenda that has no basis in truth. They're saying X when Y is the case and Y when X is the case. Just like Imam Hussein had said that he lives, a time has happened where truth is falsehood and falsehood is truth. This is what was happening. This is what's happening today. We can see it in front of our eyes. We can see it in front of our eyes. You see people like the BBC who profess to be the leaders and pioneers of human rights and you know, all these wonderful values. And at the same time, these same people praise people who are killing children, praise police officers who gun down people in the street, unarmed people in the street, and refuse to even mention it. And you see them condemn people who come out to protest these violations and these injustices. You see them condemn those people who are literally fighting for electricity in Gaza or in Yemen, constantly calling them, oh, they're Iran-backed, or they're terrorists, or they're this, or they're that. Habibi, no one cares whether they're Iran-backed or what you think. These are people, they don't have food. In the cold of winter, they don't have electricity. And you're turning around and telling me that they are the ones who are the oppressors. Whereas the country that's doing this to them, be it the Arab Zionists or the European Zionists, they're the ones that have you know, the most powerful army and the largest oil reserves and billions and billions of dollars and everything. And you're telling me they're good and that these Musta'af people are bad. The truth has become false and falsehood has become true. Mukhtar lived in that sort of time. And because he lived in that sort of time, he had to maneuver in a very specific way. But every action that he took, every, pay attention to this, every action that he took, he made sure it was in sync with what his imam, via the naib of his imam, was looking for. And when he was unsure, he verified. This is important, and this is a lesson of how we should be operating. Again, I'm not suggesting anyone get a sword and start fighting around in the streets. No, that portion in Muqtana is mainly for the drama. Although there was some fighting and stuff, yes. But really, it's about understanding the scenario we're in and understanding how to operate, how to maneuver without putting ourselves, our family, and everyone else at unnecessary risk. And while making sure that we never create a situation where Islam is defamed even in the slightest way. We have to be very careful about this. Another group that we will discuss on our journey through this idea of Muqtar, it's not a traditional Muqtar, I'm not going to give you lots and lots of historical dates and places and everything. But just ideas and thoughts and small anecdotes. Another idea we're going to discuss is that of the Tawabin. Many of you must remember I mentioned someone called Suleiman ibn Surad um, through the course of these days as someone who neglected or failed or got confused in his duty towards Muslim bin Aqil. After the event of Karbala, Suleiman ibn Surad became very upset and him and other people who became upset from the people who had essentially betrayed Imam Hussein organized themselves as a group called the Tawabin. Tawabin means those people who are sorry, essentially, to put it in very simple terms. The ones who are sorry, the ones who are making Tawbah for what they did. And they wanted to go and they wanted to go into battle with people like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and everything and to get justice. But their purpose for going into battle was not to win. Their purpose to going into battle was to join the caravan of shuhada and allow themselves to be killed. This is not allowed in Islam. This is suicide, which is a problem. Alhamdulillah, in the end, it was a little bit more positive than that. Yes, they were all killed. And yes, some people from 
the Tawabin became very confused, very confused. But ultimately, Allah Yarhamuhum, they tried to help in some way. So we will discuss them. But really, today, I think the important thing we've managed to discuss, and so tomorrow we will be going into the idea of Mukhtar in a little bit more depth. So now, can I ask you to give me a loud salawat and we move into the musibah? Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Sallallahu alayka ya Ibn Rasulallah. My dear brothers and sisters, tonight, tonight we will remember a very, very close friend of Imam Hussein, a close friend of Imam Ali, and someone who was there in Kufa who saw all the injustices against Muslim, who tried his best to get information back to Imam, and ultimately, with one of his companions, he went to join the caravan of the Imam to make sure that they had the information and to make sure that they could be of service to the Imam. Of course, the person I'm speaking about is Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir and Muslim bin Awsaja were very close friends. But Habib was historically a very close friend of Imam al Hussein. He was a companion of Imam Ali according to the books of history. And he was there in Kufa. He was one of the first people to write to Imam Hussein, thinking that everyone is going to be wanting to have Imam Hussein come to Kufa yani, to govern them. When he realized what had happened, when he saw the betrayal of Muslim bin Aqil, when he saw the behavior of people like Sulaiman ibn Surad, I want you to picture Muslim, this handsome man with a completely white beard. Habib is looking towards Karbala and he's crying. He has seen what's happened to Muslim because when Muslim was completely abandoned in the masjid and ultimately he was then picked up by Ubaidullah, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad's forces, Muslim bin Awsaja and Habib ibn Madahir had gone around to some of the tribes outside of Kufa to try and get them to understand the situation and to pledge their allegiance. So when they came back in the morning, they couldn't find Muslim anywhere. They didn't know where he was. Muslim, as we had discussed, had gone into the house of the lady of, um, uh, of uh, Um Bilal. When they found out that Muslim has been arrested and he's in the, 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 in the government building of Kufa and he's going to be assassinated, they said, we have to get out of Kufa quickly, not because their lives are at stake. They weren't concerned about their own lives. They were concerned that Imam Hussein is on his way to Kufa. They need to make sure that they can get the message to Imam Hussein, if nothing else, that don't come to Kufa. The people of Kufa are not loyal to their word. Now imagine yourself, Imam Mahdi is coming. Imam Mahdi is coming and you look around. And if you see that the people of your family, the people of your community are not loyal to Imam, are you able to have the strength to go to Imam and say, please don't come? Are you able to pray to Allah to say, Ya Allah, please delay the return of Imam? No, we want the Imam to come. We need the Imam to come. So we have to make sure we become ready. And we help each and every one of our brothers and sisters through kindness and to, through compassion to become ready, to become better. May Allah reward you, Azza. Once Muslim, once uh, Habib reaches Kufa, uh, reaches Karbala, he leaves Kufa, they leave through the waterway and they come out through the marshes. They reach a place called Karbala because they didn't know where Imam Hussein was. The location where Imam Hussein was at that time was unknown. There was no GPS or anything. But they located where Imam Hussein was. They saw a camp and they went towards it. And they saw the camp of Imam Hussein and Imam Hussein was waiting in the camp. He was looking in the direction. And he says, Assalamu alayka, ya Habib. Because Habib was loved by Imam Hussein very much. He was a very close friend of Habib. Habib spoke to the, on the now I want you to fast forward yourself to the night of Tasu'a, which is the ninth of Muharram. The day before Ashura, Habib had spoken to a person who had brought a letter from Imar ibn Sa'ad 
to Imam Hussein and he asked the messenger who had brought this letter not to go back to Yazid's army, to stay over here. Habib then spoke to the army of Yazid, which was about to attack the camp because the initial attack Yazid wanted to do, Amr ibn Sa'al wanted to do, was at night. Because this is how cowards attack. You look at how Israel attacks Palestine, they will attack at night. What they did in Lebanon, they did at night. What you see Saudi doing to Yemen, it's at night. What you see the Americans did to Iraq and to Syria, you see Daesh, how they attack. All of them, they did it at night because this is how the cowards attack. Habib spoke to the enemy and he warned them against, he did his duty of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar. On the day of Ashura, on the day of Ashura, Habib, remember that Habib is someone who is maybe 75, in some cases maybe older, years old. He went into the battlefield after taking his permission. He was actually given command of the left wing of the army of Imam Hussein. And uh, Zuhair ibn Qayn uh, was given the right wing and uh, Abul Fadl al-Abbas was given the middle. So in his speech to the army, in his speech to the army of Yazid, Imam Hussein, of course, this is Imam Hussein's speech to the army of Yazid. He explained everything to them. The hujja was complete. Habib said to the people, I swear to God, I swear to God that I see you worship him with seven doubts. He's telling the army of Yazid. I swear to God that I see you worship him with 70 doubts and layers of uncertainty. I witness that you are right and have no idea what the Imam is talking about. Your heart is dark and sealed against any truth. This is the wisdom of Habib, where he sees the Imam has given a speech to the people of Kufa, to the army ranked against him, explaining who he is, explaining who Al-Hassan and Hussein are, that they are the masters of the youth of paradise. He has given so many uh, riwayat and hadith and sayings of Rasulullah about their position. And of course, we know that Shimr cut the speech of Imam Hussein, he stopped it. And this is why Habib tells them, tells the enemy that you might worship God, because like we've said, all of these people were Muslims. They worshipped Allah, allegedly. I mean, they did, but they did no clue. But he says to them something very interesting that we should bring to ourselves and ask ourselves. I swear to God that I see you worship him with 70 doubts and layers of uncertainty. And I witness that you are right and have no idea what the Imam is talking about. Your heart is dark and sealed against truth. Then Habib went out on the battlefield. I will cut this short, but Habib went out on the battlefield. He made a lot of poetry, which I'm not going to recite. He went out on the battlefield, and according to some riwayat, this 75, 75 maybe 80-year-old man managed to decimate close to 70 to 80 enemy soldiers. But ultimately, he was also, remember, all of these heroes have been thirsty and hungry for three days. Their belief is what is driving them. Their love for Allah is what is driving them. Their hearts are strong. Their belief is strong, but physically they are human. They need the energy that you and me need to continue. Allah. So he continues to fight. He fights, he fights, and at some point he can't fight anymore. He's brought down by the enemy and the enemy The enemy finished him. According to some of the maqatil, Imam Hussein says, Oh Habib, you were a virtuous person who used to recite the entire Quran every day. Now Habib ibn Madahir, look at his maqam. This is when Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you izza, no one can take this away. The enemy, of course, they trampled all the graves, they beheaded all the people, everything. But today, Today, we can see in Karbala al muqaddasa you go and if you, as, as you enter the maqam of Aba Abdullah al-Hussein, the first person you say salam to is Habib ibn Madahir. Assalamu alayka ya Habib ibn Madahir. Wa sayya'lamu alladhina dhalamu ayya munqalabin yanqalibun inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Ridham bi qadaihi wa tasliman li amri. Ya Allah, 
Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our small ibadat. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our small azar. Ya Allah, we ask you to give us the insight and awareness that you gave to Habib ibn Mabahir. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect Islam and Muslims. Ya Allah, we ask you to destroy Taghut and the Tughiyan. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect all of the believers across the world, all of the oppressed people across the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to destroy all of the oppressors and tyrants across the world. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect and give freedom to all of those believers, and especially those ulama who are illegally incarcerated, like Sheikh Ibrahim Zakzaki and Sheikh Ali Salman and others. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we ask you to protect all of the righteous believers, all of the righteous ulama, all of the righteous maraja, and especially the leader, Imam Khamenei. Ya Allah, we ask you to hasten the return of Imam Hujja Jalla Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif and to count us among those people who are with him and are a source of support and joy for him and not those who are against him and who cause him sadness. Wa akhirat da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.